Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another installment of AMP's uh, Palestine in Session titled Al Nakba 75 Years of Catastrophe. My name is Tariq Khalid. I'm Education Coordinator with American Muslims for Palestine. And this is such a momentous occasion. The Nakba lives in the hearts of Palestinians worldwide. It was not a singular event, but a culmination of a process of colonization that began in 1882 and reached its eventual climax on May 15, 1948, when Israel declared statehood and the Palestinians experienced the start of their Nakba, which means catastrophe in Arabic. The Nakba represents the ongoing, ongoing forcible displacement, ethnic cleansing, land theft, and systematic oppression of the Palestinian people. The ethnic cleansing of approximately 750,000 indigenous Palestinians from 1947 to 1949 created the space for the establishment of Israel in 78% of historic Palestine. Contrary to the Zionist mythical characterization of the Nakba as a miraculous clearing of the land, the Zionist movement meticulously and methodically orchestrated the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people and the destruction of Palestine's landscape. The Palestinian people were not only ethnically cleansed from their homeland, but were effectively denationalized. This climactic period began in 1948 and continues in 2023. We have a wonderful panel of experts today, uh, one of whom is under the weather and couldn't be with us today, Marwa Fatafta, and we wish her well and hope uh, to have her for a future webinar. But we do have with us Rawana Daman, who is the direct, Director General of Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism. She's a filmmaker and media consultant and the founder of Stream Media Consultancy. For the past two decades, she has made documentaries and TV programs and specialized in online storytelling. She has produced and directed more than 30 hours of TV documentaries that have been translated into multiple languages, including the award-winning documentary series, Al Nakba. We also have with us Wissam Ahmad, who is the head of Center for Applied International Law in Al Haq. Wissam has been working as a human rights advocate with Al Haq since moving to Palestine in 2006, focusing on the area of business and human rights and the role of corporate actors in economic incentive structure, perpetuating the continued colonization of Palestine. We also have with us our executive director, Dr. Osama Abu Shaid. He's also a board member of uh, AMP, and he's also a board member of the U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations, which is an umbrella organization of eight major national American Muslim organizations. He lectures frequently and is a regular commentator on issues relating to the Middle East and American politics. Thank you all for making the time um, to be with us uh, today for this very important topic. I want to start off with you, Rowan, if I may. You know, you put together what I think uh, is just a phenomenal documentary series on the Nakba years ago. This four-part documentary series, which I recommend to everybody. It's, it's rich in content, and I definitely recommend um, that everybody watch this four-hour documentary. Can you give us a little background on al Nakba and its historical underpinnings and the importance of the Palestinian narrative? Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, Tariq, and thanks for AMP for this. Uh, this series, Al Nakba, as you said, is available online in uh, on YouTube in 10 different languages, and I'm so glad that it's used in many universities and colleges around the world, even the United States, to teach about the story of Palestine. So many people, they think that our story started in 1948, and they think that it's 75 years of our story. Uh, in reality, it's not. It's over 220 years. Uh, you can start this story many, many decades and centuries ago. But in Al Nakba documentary, after a lot of research, I think the start beginning should be in 1799. Not because the dream of uh, Zionists started at that time, because there are a lot of novels in the 16th century that spoke about um, uh, Palestine, but uh, in 1799, it was the first political moment when Napoleon Barbart, uh, during his invasion to the Levant, invited the Jews of the world to settle in Palestine. So it was a 
a, pol a political empire leader who adopted the Zionist narrative that was still mostly in literature at that time. His campaign failed, and with it, of course, the French version of the Balfour Declaration, because many people think that the Balfour Declaration is the only one that the British issued in 1917. It wasn't. A lot of Balfour Declarations uh, were before. So from 1799 until, nine, until 1841, I think at that time, so 40 years later, there was an earlier British version of the Balfour Declaration. A letter arrived in Damascus from the British consul Charles Henry Churchill to Moses Hayim, who was the leader of the Jewish community in the United Kingdom. This letter, which we still have until today, it's 40 pages, the letter included a comprehensive plan to settle Jews in Palestine. The project took off and the first British Jewish settlements were established in Palestine in 1860. The settlements, however, remained almost empty, but the plan was very structured. The British Foreign Office was convinced that the time was not ripe at that time. It took many, many periods, you know, where Christian Zionists from France, Germany, Russia, the United States were establishing scattered settlements in Palestine. I think it's important, especially that we are talking to an American audience, to know that the American Christian Zionist, William Blackstone, the author of the book Jesus is Coming, was the mastermind behind the first political conference in the United States entitled at that time in 1890, it was called the past, present and future of Israel. And that conference was held in Chicago in 1890 and called for an international conference to empower the Israelis in Palestine. And in 1891, Blackstone handed the American president at that time, Benjamin Harrison, a petition with more than 400 signatures from Christian Zionist leaders and some Jews. The petition stated that now Palestine must return to the Jews. And the American Balfour-like declaration was never issued uh, formally from the United States. So that all happened before many people start our story, you know, and the Zionism story with the book of Theodore Herzl, The State of the Jews. So the conference even happened five years before the publication of the book, The State of the Jews, by the Zionist uh, Jewish leader, of course, Theodore Herzl. And following that, there were many German support at that time from the German emperor, uh, where there was a great discussion about the settlements of Jews in Palestine. And it was, of course, that at that time, the Ottoman emperor and that idea was rejected and the plan failed again. But there were many, many Zionist conferences at the beginning the notion of a public and political declaration supportive of Zionism by the world power was at the top of their agenda. So Herzl at that time, you know, sent a letter to the American Zionist movement in 1900. We are in talking about urging members to obtain declaration by the American president stating that such a declaration would be more important than hundreds of conferences that were held east and west of America. Those are the words of Herzl at that time. And so there was also a Russian uh, Balfour Declaration like in, in 1903 and different, you know, uh, British initiatives at that time. At that time, in 1903, we are talking about Arthur Balfour himself, which is the known at the Balfour Declaration. He was the prime minister at that time in Britain. And uh, it was a very detailed plan to resettle Jews in Kenya. That was one of the goals of blocking the immigration of poor Eastern, Eastern you know, European Jews coming to the United Kingdom. And the majority of the attendants of the sixth uh, Zionist conference at that time approved this plan. And it took many years until uh, Wiseman met, you know, Balfour in 1906 uh, during his election campaign in Manchester, and they discussed the British plan to settle Zionist Jews in Kenya, which was known always as the Uganda plan. And this also failed 
And there was a breakthrough when uh, Wiseman defended very much the Palestine option and Belford uh, asked him if he is really talking about Palestine and that when Wiseman decided to visit Palestine for the first time and that was in 1907. He participated in establishing what is known as Palestine Land Development Company. And that's very important to understand. It was a company that they called Palestine Land Development. And from here started to try to buy land during the Ottoman rule and to settle more Zionists. So between 1882, that you know Tarek mentioned when we started, 1882, until 1907, around 2,000 Zionist Jew settlers from Eastern Europe, from Yemen, arrived in Palestine, and they established around 30 settlements. And then Wiseman got the British citizenship in 1910 and continued to strengthen the ties between Zionism and British politicians. And the official British interest that started many, many years before in 1840 became more uh, materialized. It was the way of the UK to really resolve the Jewish problem they had. Of course, the biblical notion that Jews should return to establish the kingdom of God and the return of Christ. And so the first meeting for the British government after the declaration of the war, and we are talking about World War I, the First World War, it was November 1914 that the Zionist movement was discussed. And David Lloyd George, at that time heading the government uh, seven ministers in Britain, who had worked very closely uh, with the Zionists, during that meeting, they decided that they need to invite Herbert Samuel in December 1914 and the encountering with Wiseman and started to plan for a document that was confidential at that time. And we have a copy of that in Al Nakba documentary, the document of 1915, where Herbert Samuel, and it's a six pages document that is at the Middle East Center in Oxford University today, it's called The Future of Palestine. Herbert Sumael wrote this document and it was very, very clear with detailed steps how to build a Zionist entity in Palestine, how to include and place 4 million Zionist Jews in Palestine. And this project was really the base that the British political ideas were implemented until 1948. From 1915, that was a practical, clear plan that was, of course, confidential and secret at that time. But then when the British mandate started in Palestine, of all the people they chose for the first British commissioner in Palestine, Herbert Samuel himself, to come and implement his plan from 1920 to 1925, to the extent that some people say that the Palestinians lost Palestine in 1925. And some other people say we lost it in 1939. But in 1925, there was 100 laws against the Palestinian Arabs, the majority of the people of Palestine, to implement transferring this country into a Zionist Jewish state. And this would never have happened be be without the ethnic cleansing of the people. You cannot have 90% of the people be removed from this country with many, many ways, but only the ethnic cleansing that really happened in 1948. And you mentioned over 750,000 people were ethnic cleansed. And this means using massacres, violence to get people out of Palestine. I think many Palestinians, unfortunately, not only you know Arabs, Americans, other people, they don't understand the roots of this story. They think that the roots started much earlier to where it started really and this is why i recommend people who are interested to understand the roots to watch historians archives talking about the story oh thank you uh so much uh Rwan. um that i mean that do that documentary i i don't know how many times i've watched it but i feel like every time i watch it i learn something new or i i, f I forget a name that 
I should have known. You know, we think of just a few names and those are the names that we stick out. But there's a lot of individuals involved that played a hand in this. Um, and, you know, I definitely have um, questions, um, but I, I, want, I want to leave that to the to the end. Thank you for that. Thank you for that background. Um, with Sam, I want to I want to move to you and we're going to we're going to shift. A, we're going to shift a couple of gears here. And if you want to piggyback off of what Rwan said, please do as well. But Israeli accountability has gained a lot of traction over the last decade or so, and I would say more so in the last few years. Yet it still seems we're far away from holding Israeli officials and Israel accountable for war crimes and crimes against humanity. So right now, at this, at this moment, what are the avenues of accountability that is available to the Palestinian people? And what role do you feel economics play in pursuing those avenues? Salam alaikum, everyone. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here with American Muslims for Palestine. Uh, Rawan, thank you very much uh, for that uh, opening. Uh, I definitely uh, learned uh, something new as well. Um, and I, I definitely think it's important for us to, to look back further in history than what we have been conditioned to do to really understand the, the, the big picture. Um, and I think, uh, you know, to, uh, to answer the question that Tariq posed, uh, it is important to frame the challenges in the pursuit of accountability within the broader context. And uh, as you laid out, uh, Rawan, uh, the issue of Palestine um, and, uh, and the settlement of Jewish people in Palestine and the convergence of the Zionist ideology um, has been part of a broader imperial dynamics, first and foremost, and uh, the exploitation of the Jewish community for imperial ends. And uh, we see that continuing uh, in the present day. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, is also uh, missing in, in our discussions about uh, uh, Palestine is, is the economic dimension through which uh, the, the colonization of Palestine uh, took place. You mentioned uh, the Palestine Land Development Company, and I think it, that's a great example of one of many companies that played a role in the shaping of the situation that we are in today. Um, and the, the British mandate uh, uh, made sure to give uh, the important concessions like the Dead Sea and the Haifa Harbor and Palestine Electric uh, to uh, Zionist interests to ensure that uh, economic uh, control. Now, the, the ongoing Nakba that we face as Palestinians is a process of continued colonization. And when we look at the issue of accountability for contemporary forms of uh, colonialism, we need to ask ourselves, where is international law in the issue of colonialism. The unfortunate reality is that the practice of colonialism uh, was an acceptable practice in the eyes of uh, the, those that were doing the colonizing and in fact uh, helped to shape the development of international law. Um, but over time, the, the world uh, saw the practice of colonialism as something uh, that should be prohibited. Uh, the decolonization process uh, um, uh, continued to evolve, reaching the point uh, in the 60s where we saw the, the development of uh, the, the prohibition of colonialism within an international sense. And this is where uh, international law that we try to make use of today, the tools that are available to us, uh, things like uh, the, the UN Charter, uh, the, if, to the International Criminal Court, um, all these uh, tools uh, such as the Human Rights Council, uh, jurisdictions uh, in uh, different parts of the world that open up opportunities to make use of their uh, particular uh, legislation to challenge activity. All of these things are part of the evolution of international law. And so when we look at the continued colonization of Palestine, we need to ask ourselves, how is it that we are able to or how the international community is able to uh, stand idly by and watch the practice of colonialism uh, continue on the backs of Palestinians. And what we try to do at Al Haq is to try to challenge that continued colonization of Palestine using the mechanisms uh, that uh, are available. But in the end, international law requires political will for it to work. Uh, the, the political uh, apparatus that uh, uh, drives the development of international law also 
uh, plays a role in the movement of these mechanisms within uh, the respective uh, systems that they might exist in. And this takes me to the, the broader imperial dimensions and economic interests uh, therein. Why is it so difficult to hold Israel accountable? Why is it so much easier for uh, um, sanctions to be imposed uh, against Russia um, for its invasion of Ukraine? And why is it so much more difficult to have sanctions imposed against Israel for its continued colonization of Palestine? And this is where I think it requires us to step back and see that the situation is not a binary uh, relationship uh, uh, of a conflict between Palestinians and Israelis. There are broader uh, um, interests uh, at play that influence how uh, the, the law is implemented and how it's uh, uh, enforced or uh, it's uh, or the lack thereof actually in in our context. So Israel has developed what I call a best business practice of colonialism. It is uh, taking the broader uh, economic interests uh, of uh, different actors uh, around the world and having them invest in uh, the colonization of Palestine. And one of the questions that was posed early on. Uh, the one you mentioned the, the initial attempts to colonize Palestine and uh, and uh, have it uh, settled uh, um, <clears throat> early on and those failed uh, and Herzl was critical of those attempts calling them philanthropic colonialism um, and uh, and he was critical saying that uh, we shouldn't uh, use philanthropic colonialism uh, we should uh, uh, use a business lens uh, for that and another archival document that maybe you can add to uh, uh, your uh, next uh, version um, of, uh, of your excellent work is a, a document from 1925 that was written by David Levantin, who uh, um, headed up the Anglo-Palestine Company. Um, and the title of that document was The Colonization of Palestine, Means and Methods. And where that the question was posed in this document of what medium should be used to colonize a country on a large scale? Should it be done by philanthropy or treated as a business proposition along strict business lines? And this is where I think uh, the, the economic dimension plays a role in influencing the pursuit of accountability, where getting people to have an interest in the colonization of Palestine, benefiting from it, whether it's profiting from it uh, through uh, foreign direct investment um, and having uh, their companies operate here, um, or where Israel has taken advantage of having a captive population uh, to develop uh, weapons and uh, uh, technology against, and then market that to the rest of the world. And so in this broader sort of economic uh, lens, you see the various interests at play that make it, uh, uh, irrational from their perspective to counter uh, Israel's policies in a way that might hurt their interests. And this is why I think it's important for us to develop our work uh, in a way that uh, makes a convergence of interests, where it isn't simply asking the international community uh, to act for the sake of Palestinians alone. It is about trying to ensure the integrity of the international system as a whole. Because if we continue to allow an exception to exist within the system, that undermines the integrity of the system as a whole, no matter how uh, nice those mechanisms might sound, like the International Criminal Court or the International Court of Justice. Uh, so long as uh, there isn't uh, proper tangible action taken to shift this cost-benefit calculus where Israel's practices uh, result in costs rather than benefits, we're going to continue uh, down the cycle. So I think uh, it is a, a continued challenge that we need to face and uh, and be innovative. And the adversity that we face, I think, uh, is a source of innovation where we need to find more creative ideas uh, to, uh, to have a more utilitarian approach of the convergence of interests in securing rights that impact Palestinians and improve their situation, but improving the situation in Palestine and justice for Palestinians is a contribution to justice on a global scale. And Palestine is just a microcosm 
of global injustice. So the more we tackle it in a collective sense, the stronger we will be and the more potential for uh, uh, accountability uh, in the future. I think uh, we remain optimistic that there will be a shift. Uh, we just have to continue to push down that road and remain steadfast as we are very good at doing as Palestinians. But obviously it doesn't come without a cost. The more work we do to push, the more consequences we are uh, should be uh, we should expect to face. And Al Haq, as an organization, has been attacked for its work, uh, specifically on the area of the International Criminal Court. Uh, been designated as a terrorist organization, had our offices raided. Uh, but this, I think, is uh, part of the price we have to pay uh, in the pursuit of accountability. And so long as uh, uh, people uh, around the world continue to stand by us. We're going to keep pushing until we achieve that goal and hopefully realize the right self-determination of the Palestinian people together. We never give up. Absolutely not. Um, and, and it's interesting. Um, one thing you said, uh, was, I mean, a lot of things you said, very interesting. And I, I, wa I want you to send me, you and Rowan, I want you to send me all of your notes so I can relearn some of this stuff. Um, but colonization was a you know, was an oft-touted statement and process and spoken of in a very proud way. It was, you know, it was unabashedly, you know, the colonization project was an, was just, was was part and parcel of uh, Zionism. It's, it's, it's interesting that now the narrative, the Zionist narrative tries to stay away from that kind of term, terminology when it was said in such a, in, in such a broad and consistent way early on. And speaking of, speaking of shifts, Dr. Sama, um, thank you so much. I know you're uh, it's a, you're a little under the weather, but thank you for being with us today because I want you to kind of connect the dots for us in the American context. So for those that study this issue closely, uh, they, they understand now that there's been a sea change in terms of American public opinion. So can you kind of connect the dots between the macro and the micro? We're 75 years since the Nakba began. Where's US policy today? What is your perspective on the shifting dynamics in the in the United States? And given those dynamics, how can we further the Palestinian cause? And also in addressing that question, please, if you if you wish, piggyback off of what either Wissam or Ruan has said as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. And uh, thank you, uh, Ruan, Wissam. Uh, I learned a lot. And um, this just reminded me that we need as Palestinian to construct or reconstruct our narrative and i'm going to talk from an american framework here um you know it, it was reported widely reported that when truman uh, the uh, truman uh, president truman in 1948 when he recognized the state of israel against the advice of his own national security team against the pentagon against the u.s army at the time uh, he was heard saying i'm cyrus i'm cyrus and what he meant by it he was comparing himself to Cyrus the Persian, who allowed the Jews back in Palestine, according to, to their narrative. So it is very important that we reconstruct our narrative because there are so much misinformation here in the United States. In addition, there is a religious and historical component if we want to talk about the Protestant and the evangelical movement in the U.S. For the evangelical movement, it's not about politics. It is about religion. So this is very important that we reconstruct our 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 narrative because in the in the the lack of presence of a historical and religious narrative you're leaving a void and the other side is building their narrative playing on these religious sensitivities religious calculations for the evangelical in this country and we are shy uh, we shy away from talking about our historical narrative that palestine existed Pal uh, existed even before there were the the hebrews before there were Jews, uh, Jewish in Palestine, even before there was Ibrahim والسلام, in Palestine. Of course, that will take us to the religious nar narrative if we're referencing Ibrahim. But in terms of presence, the canonized were there first. So this is very important. Sometimes we undermine, we underestimate the influence of this, but it is playing a major role in the American politics. So this work is very important. Now, I'm not going to go to the, um, um, you know, and it, it was very informative what, what Rowan spoke about in terms of the American context in uh, uh, enhancing the Zionist 
narrative and Zionist policy to colonize Palestine. But I'm going to use 1917 as a point of reference here because there, uh, 1917 is the, um, the point of inflection in terms of the policy shift in the United States in relation to Palestine. What we know is that it is the British government, the George Lloyd's government in 1917, that issued the Balfour Declaration. So that's given. November 29th, the Balfour Declaration was issued by the British government to the Zionist movement. But what we don't talk much about is that the British government at the time did not dare to issue the Balfour Declaration before it secured the approval of the Wilson administration, Wilson, uh, Woodrow Wilson's administration. So they asked the Zionist organization at the time, or the Zionist movement, to try to lobby the U.S. government. And they were very successful in lobbying Woodrow Wilson in September 1917. That's when he gave his approval to the Balfour Declaration. That's when the British, British government issued the Balfour Declaration two months later. And then the U.S. Congress adopted the Balfour Declaration in 1922. So what I want to say is that the United States has been complicit since day one in the Palestinian Nakba. If we're talking about it in the historical perspective, now if we want to talk about it in the ongoing Nakba, I, I, I don't think anyone will differ over the U.S. complicity because we see it unfolding before our own eyes. But history, historically, it was the U.S., the Wilson administration, that gave that approval to the Balfour Declaration and things start unfolding from that point on. Now, Wilson, had, Wilson was a Democrat. Truman was a Democrat. Johnson was a Democrat. Truman was in 1948. Wilson was with the Balfour Declaration. Johnson was in 1967 when Israel occupied the rest of historical Palestine. Today, we see a real shift in the United States, a real shift in terms of the public opinion, uh, in the public opinion domain, and a real shift within the Democratic Party. But we don't see the same shift taking place in the policy domain. And that's where we have to invest our efforts. Because, I mean, and I always use the same example, we have 79% of the American people const uh, constantly, uh, sh um, you know, say that they are for stricter gun laws in the United States. But we never seen this translating into policy. So we have... A, a, a pandemic here in America, mass shooting pandemic in America, but still politicians will not act on the will of the 79% of the American people. The reason is, or the reason given to this is that the 79% don't are less passionate, less enthusiastic about this issue vis-a-vis -vis those who are for gun rights, uh, gun rights and uh, deregulating gun uh, rights. So unless we build this movement and make this a real movement for change, nothing will change in America. A recent poll, uh, poll came out in, uh, on uh, March 16th by Gallup showed that 52% of Democrats today are more sympathetic to Palestine. We have a Democratic administration uh, in, uh, uh, in the White House that is still complicit with Israel. Why? Again, because this is not being translated into a priority. It's not being prioritized by the by the 52% of Democrats so far. But things are changing in the positive direction. We are moving in the right direction. We have to continue this work, and we, we can talk about more details about this. But what I want to say is that since 1917 until today, each administration has uh, uh, been uh, bequeathing um, uh, complicity to the next one. So if we talk about uh, Wilson as the point of reference, he just laid, laid down the, uh, the ground. Another administration came, gave another um, uh, leverage for more complicity for the administration to come out until we got to Barack Obama. And some people think that Barack Obama was better for Palestine, but he could not depart from that complicity. Now, what we need to do here in America is again make the the uh, uh, the uh, the more Americans or make the change in America's public opinion more geared towards changing the policy. That's what we need to work on. But we cannot move forward just by changing perceptions, just by increasing the levels of of sympathy, if we don't build 
uh, or construct a narrative. This construction will require us to speak about or to compare the situation in Palestine to what the natives in America suffered. So we cannot talk about the expulsions of the Palestinian people, displacing the Palestinian people, if we don't show parallels to what happened to the natives in America. Because this is easier for the American public to digest than just speaking about a quote-unquote foreign issue. So that's one thing that we need to do. And I'm hoping that maybe Rowan will take note here and maybe help us do this work. You know, when we talk about the uh, Trail of Tears, let us show the Trail of Tears through the experience of the Palestinians when they were in, in mass, when they were, uh, you know, uh, leaving Palestine uh, in, in masses. That is that is one story or that's one picture of the story. If you want to talk about apartheid today, let us show how the African-Americans lived in America and compare this to the situation or the uh, Jim Crow laws in, in America. If we're talking about segregation again. So building this narrative is so important. And just to give another example, uh, Palestinians were very upset about a statement that was made by the president of the EU, uh, EU's commission, um, uh, you know, transfer, uh, when she claimed that Israel transformed a desert to an oasis today. I mean, this is a dominant narrative in the West. Whether we like it or not, we can condemn her as much as we want. But as long as you don't have your own narrative of there, then you have a serious problem. This will continue to dominate. This will continue to trend until we say, in fact, even the Old Testament refers to Palestine even before Ibrahim migrated to Palestine as the land of honey and milk. If you don't start from there, then you're not injecting the historical and the religious narrative, let alone talking about the legal and the humane narratives, because there are other narratives that should be, you know, a part of our, of our construction. Uh, Israel is fighting terrorism. Israel massacres in Gaza. And then you see Israeli politicians and Israeli officials saying we were killing terrorists. Again, where is my narrative other than condemning this? So in order for us to shift the policy in the United States, it's not only that we need to be more enthusiastic, not only that we need to be more passionate, not only that we need to be more professional and more organized and mobilize more and educate more. Yes, all of these components are very important. But if you lack the facts and address all of the components of the picture of the issue that we're dealing with, we're not going to be able to move as far enough to change perceptions in America and in, by extension, change the policy in the U.S. The last point I want to make, and it's something very important that uh, uh, Sam said. You know, when you become more effective, you are more receptive, and you become a clearer target to your to your op opponents and enemies. So Al-Haq now is being uh, designated as a terrorist organization. Our voices in America are, uh, there are efforts to delegitimize our voices. Whatever we say, then you are accused of anti-Semitism. So today, if you accuse Israel in the United States, and I'm giving actual facts, I'm not just making assumptions. If you accuse Israel, in fact, you're not accusing, you're charging Israel with war crimes, you're anti-Semitic. Immediately, you're anti-Semitic. You cannot say Israel commits war crimes. If you talk about the influence of the Zionist lobby in the United States, you're anti-Semitic because, oh, he's denoting now the Jewish influence, the Jewish influence. So we cannot talk about Israel today without being accused of being anti-Semitic. This conflation between Zionism and Judaism, between Israel and Judaism, is by design, is by design, because now they got to a point where they cannot defend the actions of Israel. So the only way is to delegitimize or to try to delegitimize these voices. Now, our role is not to be intimidated. Our role is to fight back. And this will require us again to gather our resources, have a plan, not only to be in a responsive mode. If we continue to be in a responsive mood, nothing will change in America. We have to be cognizant of the facts and we have to have 
a plan moving forward. And we see things are changing mainly with millennials, mainly with the Gen Zs in America. So I always say the future belongs to us in America. Now I'm going to focus on America. The future belongs to us because we see, according to the consecutive public opinion polls, millennials, Gen Zs are more sympathetic to Palestine as compared to Israel. This is a given fact. How do we continue investing in this? How do we ensure that when these when these two generations or the Gen Z's generation is in power, is leading America, the uh, the generation of uh, John McCain, uh, Joe Biden is the outgoing generation. I mean, he could run to, uh, for president again and the Gen X and, uh, you know, even some millennials still can run today. But in 15, 20 years from now, the, the dynamics will shift in America in a very dramatic way. If we fail to invest from now, then we have lost another two generations to shift the U.S. policy in America. I'm not going to say that America will be in favor of Palestine in 20 years from today, but at least at the at, at least less complicit in favor of Israel. And this will change a lot of dynamics in Palestine itself because the Palestinians are still getting massacred. Their homes are still being bulldozed. Uh, they still live under this colonization and under this brutal regime of Israel because of the enablement of our own government here. Without America, this cannot continue on the same trajectory. So I know there are a lot of things that we need to do to connect more dots than the dots that you asked me to connect. But I think building, having a plan, part of it, a historical, religious, legal, humane, narratives are very important for our work in the West, West, not only in the United States, are very important to move forward and not only to think that the Palestinians can liberate Palestine on their own. They cannot. It's not going to happen. They can maintain and they can protect Palestine and preserve Palestine to continue to exist. And they're doing beyond what any human being is capable of doing. But it's not fair that we lay it all on their shoulders. They need our help and they need our, our assistance, and we are in a position to do it. There's a lot of dots, uh, a lot of dot connecting there, Dr. Osama. Um, I have so many things I want to I wanna talk about. Um, you know, when you were talking, Dr. Osama, the one thing that came to mind, something that I learned in law school, if, uh, if uh, your client's case is, is unwinnable, try to change the subject, and maybe you can itch out some kind of victory. And that's exactly the, that's exactly the process there. And also I want to give our audience um, hope um, because this incremental approach that Dr. Sam was talking about, you know, 20 years, you know, who knows, it could be next year. We don't know, but we can't stop fighting. The Zionist project as Dr. as, uh, as uh, Rwanda Daman said, you know, it's 1799. So it's not like Zionists formed a group and then next day Israel was created. That was also an incremental approach. It finally reached the climax in 48, but that was also an incremental approach. So um, this, the, these things cannot happen overnight. Um, I kind of want to work backwards a little bit. I want to start with Rwan, but the, uh, Dr. Sama, there's something I don't want to forget here. And that is um, considering these, uh, the, the shifting, the, this dynamic shift in the United States, I, I want to point to two things that I think were, were, just huge, just in the last couple of couple of weeks. Um, Rashida Tlaib, Rep Representative Rashida Tlaib's Nekba resolution that's now being pushed, and it's co-sponsored by five other congresspersons. Um, it's calling for, you know, demanding the to stop U.S. complicity in Israeli crimes, among other things. And also the United Nations um, commemorating a Nekba, unprecedented. So, uh, how, like, I mean, there's there's also a lot of other examples as well. But, how do, but where does that put us? Does that does that take us one step closer as well? And can we can we use these two examples to kind of you know uh, push this narrative even or push push this goal of liberating Palestine in a quicker fashion? Giving these two two things that occurred just recently. So, Tarek, you know, in in our work here in America, uh, we always talk, and maybe I don't know if you've heard me saying this before, but I always say. Enough with identifying the challenges in America. We know them. I mean, the whole process is a challenge. Let us talk about the opportunities. 
because that's what proves our worth here in America. So in terms of opportunities, I think now we are seeing a way forward to serve Palestine, and we see it's paying, uh, it's paying off. Um, you know, when, when we um, uh, started our first advocacy day uh, in the U.S. in 2015, I remember 20 of us going to the State Department, going to a few offices in, in U.S. Congress, um, 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 and we didn't have an agenda. We didn't know what we were doing. Since that day, the process has transformed. Now, our Palestine Advocacy Days um, is the largest event that is taking place lo lobbying for Palestine. In 2017, we faced challenges. Offices didn't want to meet with us in 2017. 2018, some offices didn't want to meet with us. In 2021, 2020, 2021, 2019 before that, and this year, inshallah, more offices want to meet with us. So there is more reception now, more understanding that this is becoming a movement. Palestine is being mainstreamed. No longer members of Congress just can ignore the fact that there is a change in America. When we were meeting with the State Department before, um, I mean, then I, I don't think they were taking us seriously. Now they take us more seriously. When Kevin McCarthy tried to block the um, Nakba commemoration uh, by Rashida Tlaib and um, co-sponsored by some of our organizations, they also failed. He also failed because we have allies. We ended up getting a, a haul by Senator Sanders. So now you have allies. What I want to say is, yes, maybe we didn't get to the point to transform policy, but now we're pushing back and we're kicking back. We're not at the same level of the other side, but they're not able uh, to knock us down. This is very important. Uh, the right-wing Zionist mon money played a major role in the, um, in the uh, Democratic primaries in 2022, uh, 2021. But, I mean, they weren't very successful with the majority of those who are perceived by them as good on Palestine. So what I, want to, what I want to say here is no longer the other side has that perception by some of us of a monopoly over our politics. In 2021, uh, uh, a group of progressives in the U.S. House were able to block a continuation resolution just because it continued an, uh, an item about replenishing the uh, Iron Dome after Israel Attack, brutally attacked Gaza. Now, some might say, you know, let's look at the glass half empty. The next day, both members of uh, both parties of, of, of Congress came together and voted uh, almost, um, um, you know, with an overwhelming majority to replenish the Iron Dome. But it wasn't before the, the replenishing the Iron Dome was taken out from the, the continuation resolution. They had to vote on it uh, as as a singular uh, you know item, again I'm looking at the glass half full. This is for this is as far as I know, the first defeat Israel suffered in the U.S. Congress. Israel is now becoming more of a partisan issue. It's no longer a bipartisan issue, no longer does not transcend politics, no longer. I mean these are very major accomplishments. So one of these accomplishments, as you said that we were able to defeat Kevin McCarthy by, by recognizing the Nakba from the U.S. Congress. They thought that they had defeated us. They did not because we had more allies in the U.S. Congress. So I'm going again to look for opportunities. Let us not talk about the challenges. We know Kevin McCarthy, the majority of Democrats, let alone Republicans, did not want this event to take place. We were able to Make sure to ensure that this place, this event took place in the U.S. Congress. So for those who lost hope in America, I would say, no, I mean, don't lose hope here. Because I, 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 and I don't want to now go and, um, you know, bring other examples where other movements in this country were thought at one point, you know, uh, that they, know, they would never have a way forward with their agenda because they were rejected by the overwhelming majority of Americans at the time. Now in America... You know, 
they became the mainstream. Today, they became the mainstream. Yes, they had to suffer because of it. They had to sacrifice because of it. We know what they went through. I mean, this is what America is about. I'm sorry, I don't live in Egypt. I don't live in North Korea. I don't live in Saudi Arabia. I live in America where I can push back and I can speak up and I can fight and advocate for what I believe in. Yes, there might, I, I mean, I, we know what, 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 the, what the state is capable of, but also we know what the people, people here in America are capable of. This is what we need to focus on. Let us look for these opportunities and continue this fight because we see the change is, is taking place. We see the trajectory trending up, not trending down. This is a very important accomplishment. I always say we started our backs to the wall. Now we have pushed them a few inches, you know, back. That's for me an accomplishment. I am going against a massive lobby and a massive and, uh, uh, you know, a very deep movement in the U.S. because we have the evangelicals who truly believe from uh, in a religious framework that Israel should not only continue to exist, it should be victorious, it should wipe out all of the enemies of Israel. And I mean, you can go and read, this is not an, uh, these are not assumptions that I'm making. The, this is a deep, profound belief that yeah. exists I within 83% of Americans, but we're changing it. Yeah, I think it's very, very important how you started and ended with this, starting from, you know, Woodrow Wilson in 1917, getting all the people to understand that uh, the advice of the American president at that time, Woodrow Wilson was requested twice during the drafting of the declaration. So in September and October of 1917, the first time the president st stated that the time was not right to issue the declaration. The second time requesting that he acknowledge this and keep it confidential at that time and not public information. And so starting from understanding that he put a telegram of his approval of the text of the declaration, which was discussed over five drafts, from understanding this, and maybe I advise everybody listening to us and watching us to go through reading the Balfour Declaration, which is 67 words, understanding that the content contains what America today agree on. First, that this says Zionist Jews and not Jews were Britain's ally represented by the British Zionist Federation. It's not the Jews. There are a lot of Jews who are pro Palestine and they work with us in the States and all of that. So that's first. Second, Palestine as a geographical entity. Until today, they regard this as a geographical entity, not as a state, not as a political state. Three, when they say the UK will use all its full power to achieve the Zionist colonization of Palestine, that's what's happening today. The full power of this military, politically, economically, all of that then the non-Jews in Palestine are not considered in any way a majority uh, and they have no weight, no political rights mainly. They have only civil and religious rights that we speak about, not political things. That's have been in the last from 1917 until today. And the last, the Jews inside Palestine are recognized as being far beyond their minority status and have all the political rights. And even outside of Palestine, they have their political rights in any country in which they live. The five pillars of the declaration are still mainly the political, not only in the States, even in Europe, what they want to push forward. I do believe we Palestinians have our own narrative. We just need to present this narrative. And I think what Tarek said about the new things with the Rashida Tlaib, which was doing on the UN, is really pushing. And we need to push this critical mass to work together, not only with Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims, but all people who are pro-Palestine, because this is really a justice international thing. And I'm very glad, you know, Usama explained it in a very, very uh, comprehensive way of getting us from the history of what's happening today. And I would like to hear Usama's contribution into this. Uh, thank you, Rowan. Thank you, uh, Usama. I think, uh, I mean, 
the issue of religion and how it's uh, um, exploited uh, is something we can't ignore for sure. But I think it's important to keep in mind, again, putting it in this broader context, that throughout history, religion has played a role in justifying colonial endeavors. It, uh, religion has always been exploited uh, within uh, these colonial endeavors. And I think it's important to ensure that uh, our context uh, doesn't serve as an exception. Uh, it is part of this broader uh, colonial process. And not only uh, religion, but also uh, in the economic sense, uh, the, the corporate actors and the financial uh, dimension, uh, corporations have served as the commercial arms of conquest. Um, and in our context, we have uh, the activities of for-profit corporations and also non-profit uh, corporations uh, that are registered in the U.S. that have 501c3 status, uh, that are benefiting from tax exemptions, that are channeling funds to the Israeli settlement enterprise. And that money continues to flow. Um, and if you uh, uh, look at the amount of money that has come over the years and the amount of violence that has increased uh, from settlers towards Palestinians, you see a strong correlation. So uh, I think uh, there needs to be action that can be taken wherever we uh, might have the energy to do so and the resources to do so. Addressing the narrative is important, but also addressing that economic incentive structure. And I think uh, one tangible example that I wanna leave the audience with is a new campaign that has uh, been launched called Not On Our Dime. And this uh, campaign uh, is, is a bill that adds a new section to the not-for-profit corporation law um, in New York, prohibiting uh, not-for-profit corporations from aiding and abetting activity in support of illegal Israeli settlements in violation of the Geneva Conventions of 1949. So. It's a long process, no doubt, but the fact that such a bill is now on the table in the state of New York is, again, an important uh, step, uh, uh, as you mentioned, Dr. Osama, um, that things are changing for the better. I think we have to maintain that optimism. Obviously, it takes time to shift uh, um, such a, uh, a strong uh, um, public consciousness, but it is changing, and I'm confident the more people see the, the reality, the more people they understand that they have a role to play, that it isn't something simply happening uh, thousands of miles away, that what they do in their own backyard has an impact, that empowers people. And I definitely believe in the power of the individual to do something uh, that positively contributes and with everyone positively contributing in the right direction, that's where system change can take place. No, ab absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, you're seeing this change world worldwide as well, not just in the U in the United States. I mean, I, I can't I lost count of how many Nekba 75 commemoration events occurred uh, uh, worldwide. So and I think with the advent of, those, of social media, which is something that I had uh, was wanted Marwa to address, who couldn't be with us today, the role of social media and digital rights and how that impacts um, you know, or, you know, it's a double, double-edged sword, how it can impact positively, but also negatively, you know, you're silencing Palestinian voices, but also uplifting them as well. So, I mean, you have these, uh, you have these two things kind of happening at once, but we can't, uh, we can't ever, uh, give up and we're 75 years in and we're, I believe we're just, um, uh, inching closer and closer to freedom, justice, and lib liberation for all. And, I believe that the a, the a, the asymmetry that we're all pointing that we're all pointing to here, I believe that's what's more noticeable now than ever before. So these kind of talking points and propaganda campaigns don't work as well as they used to. And now people see that on one side you have an oppressor, and on one side you have an oppressed, and it's not just some quote unquote dispute over land or dispute over this or that. It's not you know two. Uh, people with suits coming to a con and agreeing on some kind of contract or settlement. But that's how it was initially presented and for a long time. So I think that that kind of lens is uh, is slowly, slowly fading in. And people, the younger generation especially, are seeing it for what it truly is. And I can't get to all of my questions. We're done here. Uh, but I really want to thank all of you. Um, for joining on um, and, you know, giving us a, a lot of information and richness that we can add 
to the conversation. We had a busy agenda as AMP last week with events across the nation commemorating Nekba 75. And just as the Nekba is ongoing, so will our organizing to end it. So please join uh, one of our upcoming events. We have events in Chicago, in New Jersey, and the Bay Area as well. We'd love to have as many people as possible. The commemoration continues, the Nekba is ongoing, and our activism must also be ongoing as well. Thank you all again very much. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you, Marcelo.